why do we need to address global biodiversity loss? Are there tangible opportunities for businesses? What is the role of the circular economy? This and much more will be covered in today's session on, on um, biodiversity as a circular business opportunity, which is being co-organized by the Finnish Innovation Fund, Citra, and the Ellen MacArthur Foundation. My name is Tim Foschland, and I'm delighted to welcome you all to this session from Citra's studio here in Helsinki. The link between biodiversity and circular economy has been covered more and more recently. And um, today we will explore this link in more detail, zooming in a little bit on the tangible business opportunities that we can find. And um, this session is in fact a continuation of yesterday's WCEF 2021 uh, session number four, The Circle of Life but also from last week's EU circular talk at the IUCN World Conservation Congress. And uh, these two events, um, I encourage you to check out both of them and we will share the link to yesterday's session uh, in the chat. So you should be able to see it there. But now I would like to dive straight into today's program where we will look more in, in detail at biodiversity as a circular business opportunity. And I could think of no one better to kick off today's session than Akanksha Khatri from the World Economic Forum, where she is the head of nature and biodiversity. Akanksha, it's a great pleasure to have you here with us, and I look forward to hearing from you. Thank you so much, Tim. Uh, and also thanks to Citra, Ellen MacArthur Foundation, and the entire team. Uh, <clears throat> for inviting me and the World Economic Forum. Um, sorry, just at the right time. Back again with you. Um, so thank you for inviting me and the World Economic Forum to kick off this session, uh, which we very much welcome. Uh, as you mentioned, I lead the work of nature and biodiversity at the World Economic Forum. And as we are the World Economic Forum, we recognize that the best contribution that we can make to the 2030 climate, nature and SDG agenda is to acknowledge that the current system, while having delivered multiple achievements on reducing infant mortality, increasing average lifespan and pulling millions of people out of extreme poverty, has also failed on many counts especially when it comes to equitable access and environmental resilience. So we at the World Economic Forum set out to take the topic of nature and biodiversity and make it relevant for boardroom discussions. This led to the publication last year of our new nature economy reports that make the business and economic case for safeguarding nature. And coming out from these insights, we curated a high level public private group called Champions for Nature. And I'm delighted to see here Kivan from um, uh, Natura because uh, the CEO of Natura is currently the co-chair of this high level community of Champions for Nature. You also mentioned a couple of other sessions yesterday as well as last week at IUCN, which form the basis of some of the discussion we will be having today. We were joined yesterday by Professor Parthadas Gupta, Inger Anderson and Elizabeth Marema. And their message, they clearly highlighted that the need to rethink every business decision has to be to take into account how we bend the curve on biodiversity loss. And I could not agree more with it. In my talk today, I want to put forward a case for interdisciplinary thinking to solve the biggest challenge facing humanity today which is climate change and loss of nature. I also want to share my conviction that we need disruptive ideas to challenge status quo. And also put forward my optimism that the success of this disruptive approach can only be secured through collaboration. Collaboration across stakeholders, so business, governments and civil society, and also across geographies, making sure that we get the voice of developing countries, indigenous people and farmers first and foremost. So to do so, let me make three suggestions. First is that we need to make a transition towards a nature positive economic model for the 21st century. 
Second is let's follow the trail of money. And third, that there can be no ecological justice without social justice. So what is it that I mean by a nature positive economic model? And Tim, you and Citra are leading quite a bit of work in this space as well. There was the recent report that came out from Ellen MacArthur Foundation, which also talked about uh, looking at biodiversity and um, uh, circular economy. And essentially what it is trying to say is let's make sure that every economic activity does not deplete nature and its resources, but actually increases it, enhances it and regenerates it. One stat which I love to use all the time is that material productivity for anyone who studied a little bit of economics would understand that material productivity is defined as the GDP relative to material and energy inputs. And it was quite surprising for me that this material productivity has stagnated since the turn of the century, which means any increase in economic growth that we see today is equivalent to an increase in resource extraction. So amazing, we should take a really step back and understand when we call ourselves the knowledge economy, when we recognize the power of technology, why and how is it that our economic growth is tied directly to resource extraction and how much actually we exploit Mother Earth? The resource extraction has actually tripled over the past 20 years and yet over 800 million people lack electricity in the world. 52% of agricultural production land is already degraded. So just let's look at it that most of the biggest socioeconomic systems which service our life, food, land and agriculture, OK. Sorry about that. It's not my best day today. I spilled some tea on my laptop. Um, so yeah, my British colonialism is now getting into my laptop. Uh, so coming back over there. Um, so I think what I was suggesting about the material productivity uh, is that the resource extraction models that we see today go across food, land and agriculture. They also go across um, the work that we do in literally every and there we go again. Um, so I hope it works fine. OK, one more term, otherwise I will uh, let it go. Um, so I think I just big question that I want to say is that we need to move to an economic model that is not tied towards extraction, but it is more moving towards regeneration. And I'm sure Kevan from Natura will speak more to it. One of the things that actually stayed with me when looking at examples of business in Natura is that there are certain product lines which actually exist only when mother. OK. Um, OK, um, I'm truly sorry about this. Maybe um, if I could hand it back to the moderator um, and then I will try to change my computer and come back on track. Well, thank you, Akanksha, and I'm terribly sorry to see that happen. I, I just have to say that I wish I had the same composure if that happened to me and a very quick reaction. So I think we will continue the, the discussion and bring our, in our next two guests and we'll comment a little bit on what Akanksha just, just said here to account for, for this. And I think here, just the last thing you, you ended with here, that we're going from an economic model that is less focused on extraction towards regeneration. I think that's a very nice way to, to take it over from here and bring, start the new a discussion, which you also highlighted, the new report from the Ellen MacArthur Foundation as well as Citrus work. And, from here, I would like to continue. And um, we have some fresh findings from both Citra, um, where we're doing a report with uh, Vivid Economics, 
as does the Ella MacArthur Foundation that just published this report at the IUCN World Conservation Congress. So I'm delighted to introduce you to our two next speakers, um, Sukaina Gay from the Ella MacArthur Foundation and Ashley Gorse from Vivid Economics. And I would like to start with, I should also remind the viewers here, uh, if you have any questions to Suki or Ashley, uh, please uh, write them in the chat. And I'll start with you, Suki. We just heard from Akanksha and uh, if you would like to both comment on, on what you just heard, if there are any, any thoughts that, that you would like to share, and also if you want to fill in on, on Bill and the message that she just, just said. Thanks, Tim. It's a pleasure to be here at the World Circular Economy Forum. And what I really liked about what Akanksha was really emphasizing is that we need to make the business and economic case to help self safeguard nature and this need for transformative change, um, especially because more than 90% of global biodiversity loss is really caused by the extraction and processing of natural resources, which is a figure that comes from the International Resource Panel. So you can see the, 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 the amount of our dependence on nature and the impact we have on nature. And so while conservation and restoration efforts are absolutely critical in our fight towards global biodiversity loss, what we also need to do on top of that is transformative change in our production and um, consumption systems that underpin our economy and that is also impacting obviously biodiversity. It's a very nice way to frame this and I understand that I think that the listeners are dying to hear about this study so could you tell us a little bit of, I mean this is what you look at could you give a bit of background what your, your study actually actually looks at? So yes yeah, so, so we recently published a paper called uh, the nature imperative and how the circular economy can help tackle uh, biodiversity loss we really explore uh, how the circular economy can offer, um, can help transform the economy to help achieve a nature positive future. So here, how can we rethink how we produce goods? How can we rethink how we grow our food so we can have this positive impact on biodiversity? So not degrading the environment, but regenerating the environment. And so here we have three key messages that we emphasize in the study that are based on the principles of the circular economy. So for those who are less familiar, I'll just go through each of them to explain the link between the circular economy and biodiversity. So the first um, principle of the circular economy is eliminate waste and pollution, and that can help reduce the threats to biodiversity. So here, if you look at plastic packaging, today we dump about one garbage truck of plastics into the ocean every minute. And if we don't take action, we will have more plastic than fish in our oceans by 2050. But what if we can rethink how we design our plastic packaging? What if we could design from the very start of the product, how, we can, how can we make sure that plastic packaging never becomes waste in the first place? And so here you can think of things like dissolvable sachets that are either made of seaweed or uh, edible cutlery or packaging, or thinking about products that um, do not need plastic packaging. These types of innovations allow us to eliminate waste and pollution and therefore reduce threats to biodiversity. The second principle of the circular economy is circulate products and materials, and this can help uh, leave more room for biodiversity. And here an example is fashion. If we look at the future, um, it has been projected that the fashion industry will, ne will need around 35% more land for um, um, cotton cultivation, for the growing of fibers, but also for livestock. But what if we could rethink how we use our clothes? So think about business models that could potentially, for example, increase your utilization of your clothes. So if we could, for example, um, use our t-shirts, our cotton t-shirts twice as long, we would be able to half the amount of land that is needed to grow that cotton and therefore make more land available for the preservation of wilderness. And so this is an example of the importance of circulating products, including the utilization of our assets, not just for fashion, but for electronics, for the built environment, and, and how this can help us make sure we don't encroach on more nature. And then the third principle of the circular economy is regenerate nature, which is, of course, an essential part in the discussion today. And if we look at food, which is one of the key drivers of biodiversity loss today, uh, it has a significant impact on biodiversity and especially the monocultures of today have a tendency of really having this extractive relationship with nature where we extract nutrients, we release chemicals, we disturb soils and release CO2 into the atmosphere and we strip local biodiversity. So 
The question here is how can we rethink how we grow our food by employing practices that have regenerative outcomes and allow biodiversity to thrive. So practices that allow creating healthy soils that can capture carbon, um, that we make sure that the nutrients we extract, we also bring back into the soil um, and just uh, diversify the crops that we use, stimulate local biodiversity in the soil as well as above the ground. And so those are the three principle of the, principles of the circular economy. And it's really all about transforming the economy to be regenerative by design. And in doing so, it has the potential to help address the 90% of biodiversity loss that is associated with how we use our goods and produce them, as well as how we grow our food. And so we explored that opportunity for four key sectors for food, fashion, the plastic packaging sector, and the built environment. Thank you, Suki. I really like how you have built this around these three easy to understand principles. Um, and uh, I think, Ashley, you have some, some um, report that's kind of links, links to this as well. Um, could you, and I understand the theory you're also trying to quantify the potential of the circular economy in tackling and reversing uh, biodiversity loss. Could you firstly just tell us why are you you're doing this? Thanks, Tim. Yeah, that's right. We're working on a report at the moment um, jointly with Citra and ourselves at Vivid Economics. And I think the EMF report um, that Sukas has described clearly sets out the conceptual case for how this circular economy could stem biodiversity loss and also sets out some really nice practical examples of how this could be done. But our work then sort of takes this work to the next level and it says um, what is essentially what would be what would the first global assessment of an economic model that uses a, a range of circular economy options how does this translate into actually stemming biodiversity loss so by this i mean if we were to transform all the sectors that most impact biodiversity um, over the next 10 to 20 years would we make a big dent in stemming biodiversity loss or would you really just scratch the surface of this like mammoth problem Currently, the evidence just simply isn't out there, and this is a gap we're really trying to fill over the next few months. Yeah, that's right, and I would like to say they are preliminary at the moment, but let me just spend a bit of time sort of setting these up first of all. So first of all, we focused on the food and agriculture sector. And there's a, one reason for this, um, as this is our main kind of area of focus at the moment. Food and agricultural sector drives, as a sector, drives the biggest sort of single loss of biodiversity. It impacts around two thirds of the world's threatened species are actually affected by um, sort of agricultural encroachment. But I think crucially for the circular economy, there's actually lots of opportunities for potentially solutions to this. You know, we know that, for example, one third of food is wasted from farm to fork. But we also know if you've been to a supermarket or a trendy burger joint recently, you know that there's an increasing amount of options that utilise things like alternative proteins that are allowing us to sort of make dents in reducing our meat consumption that actually have really big impacts on biodiversity. So what we've done is we've scoped out all of the options that are available. Um, in these sectors, which and sort of narrowed these down. So really the key interventions we think are of the mass uptake of alternative proteins. Second is um, reducing waste and loss across the supply chain. And finally, I think as Suki mentioned there, kind of uh, transforming our production model into something that utilizes regenerative agricultural techniques. And together we use these levers to create a scenario and vision of what we think a circular world in the agricultural sector could look like. Um, and I should say this is all backed up by quite a comprehensive land use model um, called the Magpie model. Now we do this quite a lot in climate change. Climate models are really, really good at doing this. And you know, if you if you're following the road to COP26, you know that in climate change we have a good idea of how to get to the future. In biodiversity, we kind of know less. So we're really trying to work quite hard now in building up this evidence base to understand how businesses, governments, citizens can use circular economy approaches to stem biodiversity loss. OK, so quickly on the findings. So we study how actions from now up until 2050 could um, work to stem biodiversity loss. And our, our, our findings, I think, are quite optimistic. If we were to be super ambitious and really transform the way we produce and consume food, we estimate that we could 
essentially stop the decline in biodiversity and by 2050 get ourselves to levels of biodiversity that we saw about a decade ago. Um, now this would take a lot of transformations and would take a lot of moving parts to sort of come together but this really I think sets a high bar of ambition of what could be achieved if you know we were to explore all these opportunities. I think what's really important is to consider these results in the context of though what, what scientists need to think needs to happen and I think Akanksha mentioned um, the term of bending the curve on biodiversity loss. There was a seminar reporter a few years ago that sort of was a synthesis of what many scientists were saying we needed to get to by 2050. So we compared our results to what the scientists were saying and found out essentially if we were to transform our food sector into one that was circular we'd get around a quarter of the way to stemming biodiversity loss in a way that is consistent with what the science is telling us. So what I think this is starting to tell us, and I you know, will underscore that this is preliminary, um, as we expect these results to be ready sort of early uh, next year, is that the circular economy is beginning and can play a much, much greater role in stemming biodiversity loss. Thanks a lot, Ashley. Uh, and I, as you say that, I would, I would just like to remind the, the viewers to to check out these these findings, both the these initial findings from uh, Citra and Vivid Economics, um, as well as the Nature Imperative report that Suki Suki mentioned. So, uh, and going back to you, Suki, I think um, you mentioned a few different business examples from plastic packaging. You mentioned the food and and uh, fashion examples as well. And I mean, there are just so many entry points for 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 businesses. Like how, how do you engage for this? And I know you have you're trying to outline outline some concrete actions that businesses could could take. So could you just give us a flavor of like what's one example of what a business could do to make uh, turn this opportunity into into action? Yes, absolutely. So businesses have this um, great opportunity to really leverage the circular economy to help meet their biodiversity ambitions. And we're seeing that more and more. Um, companies are starting to see the value of biodiversity and also uh, how they could leverage the circular economy to find solutions. So in the paper, we just wanted to highlight three key actions that businesses can take today on their journey as, as, as a way to get started. And the first, of, the first one, of course, is to help, you know, is to assess your impact and dependencies on nature and to set scientifically based targets. And having done that, the second action is then to really identify circular economy opportunities for your business that can help you meet those targets. And here in the paper, we just hint towards certain opportunity areas for these four sectors of food, fashion, plastic packaging and the built environment. Um, and, and then the third action is really collaboration, because um, if we're going to tackle this, crisis, we need to work together to find these innovative solutions. So collaboration across sectors um, within uh, the supply chain, but also with other stakeholders from policymakers, NGOs and, and universities, for example. So, okay. um, and I encourage you all to, to check out the report on the Ellen MacArthur Foundation's uh, website. Um, Ashley, going back to you, you mentioned that these are, or you highlighted that these are preliminary findings. So that begs the question, what's next? Yeah, good question. So what's next is that we've got to uh, figure out, you know, um, tweak these levers a bit more and really figure out what's going on. But I think key is that food and agriculture sector isn't the only sector that um, affects biodiversity. So what we're doing is bottling a whole suite of sectors ranging from the forest sector through to the way buildings are constructed and the way urban life happens and also the way clothes are produced. So, so how fiber productions happens and how the textile sector works. So that's the next phase. And as you should say, also as, a, as an economist, um, which I often have to give us a bit of a health warning, we're really interested in the costs, benefits and the various trade-offs that exist here. So there may be some sectors that are really, um, really high cost to transform into a circular economy. Whereas there may be some sectors that really, really can benefit in terms of low costs, high potential impacts, revenues, job creation in terms of transforming to the circular economy. So really putting these this evidence base in front of businesses and policymakers is something we're really trying to work hard in doing in the next few months. You can find it well just just to 
uh, get a taste of this uh, on, on the, the article that was just published about these, these findings. And uh, I think many of us look forward to seeing, seeing what, what's going to come next during the next uh, couple of months. Well, thanks a lot, uh, Suki and Ashley. You will stay with us um, as I invite the, the next speakers. Uh, where we hope to to bring this discussion to uh, to a more tangible level by looking at um, uh, two businesses that are already creating value from biodiversity and which have also taken actions th that are addressing biodiversity loss through circular solutions. So I'm really delighted to invite Kevin Macedo from Natura and Co and Jukka Kayen from Beanit. And here I would also like to remind the viewers to keep asking questions both to Jukka and Kevin, as well as for uh, Suki and Ashley. Kevin, starting with you, um, we, we've just heard that companies um, through regenerative practices, for instance, you can have uh, positive impacts on, on biodiversity as well. And uh, I was thinking here, could you tell us a little bit more about Natura and Co? What is it that you do? And also, if this holds true for your business, that you can have these, also have these positive impacts? And, and if so, how would you go about measuring this? Yeah, for sure. So first, uh, thanks, Citra, for the invitation. So let me share a little bit about the things that we are doing inside Natura and Co. So we certainly agree that companies can create positive impact for biodiversity and climate. We are a Brazilian company with strong foundations in the Amazon rainforest, which means that we have been acting in the regions for the last um, 20 years, trying to establish a model that we can guarantee a sustainable practice at the heart of what we do and operating with more than 30 communities in the regions. So since 2007, our mother company, Natura Cosmetics, has been a carbon neutral company. And besides all the reductions effort, we have implemented in setting projects in our value chain. Nowadays, we are protecting over 2 million hectares of the forest, which is just to give an idea, it's equivalent of half of the size of the Netherlands. And we have a goal to expand this to 3 million hectares by 2030. So we have built a business model which finds a way to create economic opportunities largely addressing pressuring environmental and social challenges. With this model, we take into account not only profit, but importantly, people and our planet. Just to illustrate a little bit more, so using Natura's Echoes line that introduced the magic of Brazilian biodiversity to the world. The products are made from the Amazonian ingredients, harvested by local communities in line with principles of fair trade and produced in a way which not only preserve the forest, but also um, in some cases even regenerates it. Throughout these lines, we connect the traditional knowledge with science to deliver products which show unique performance whistling contributing to preservation of the rainforest. Another good example in the region is that we have been connecting to more than 7,000 families. And for all our partnership with these families, we can ensure not only that we are sharing um, um, genetic heritage benefit, but also traditional knowledge. And we are engaging with those families by access and benefit sharing to ensure that they receive benefits and we can distribute this fairly to those peoples and communities that are providing us valuable resources. In context as well, this sharing of the, the benefits, uh, very interesting journey. I, I would now like to uh, turn to uh, Jukka Kayan from Beanit, who I think takes today's prize for the coolest background. But it's not only that that's cool about Beanit, but I think also your journey in Finland is a really successful one in how you've taken alternative, well, plant-based proteins to, well, quite mainstream in, in, in Finland. And I think this shift brings about many positive impacts. I was just wondering if you could tell us a little bit about this journey and for the benefit of our viewers, what makes it circular in, in, in the first place? Yeah, thanks, Tim. And thanks for having us here. It's, it's... It's our pleasure to join, join the session. Uh, so yeah, Beanit is uh, making 
fruit of, of, of Finnish fava beans. Uh, we are a domestic market leader uh, here in Finland. Um, just five years ago, we came, came up with the first uh, products to the market, and, and uh, since then, our mission has been to, to normalize plant-based eating uh, here in Finland, but also take our products abroad and, and export our products. And, and yes, what makes our business circular? I, I, I guess if the uh, definition of circular economy is to make more out of less resources, plant-based eating is definitely right in the core of that. Uh, I mean, it just makes common sense that when, when producing food, first to uh, the first to human beings instead of first to uh, to feed, uh, it, it's much more resource-wise. So, so in, in that sense, we are very in the core of circular economy. Well, thank you, Jukka. Um, going back to you, Kevin, I think um, I just asked you if you can have positive impacts on biodiversity, and I want to turn that question on its head and also ask, um, can biodiversity, well, could you tell us a little bit more if, if biodiversity can also have positive impacts for your business? Could you give us uh, some examples of, of that in, in relation to your business? Yeah, for sure. Um, so, um, as I mentioned before, we have been um, working with um, Amazonian communities for over uh, two decades. So, um, the idea that when we are doing this kind of work is that we are going to work hand in hand with the local communities because we understand that there is this aspect that we cannot uh, disassemble um, the environmental aspect with the social aspect. So we understand also that um, the local communities are the true guardians of the forest and we need to learn and we need to empower them, especially uh, women's leaders, to protect and preserve not only the rainforest, but also uh, all this knowledge that they have been um, receiving from their ancestors. So uh, one good example that I can share with you is regarding the Ukuba tree. So Ukuba tree is grown in the wetlands and banks and the streams of the Amazon rainforest. In response of the trees over exploitation, which put at the risk of extinction in the early 90s, Naturi started buying the tree seeds such to place an economic value on the standing tree. So local communities receive three times more for half of the tree seeds annually from Natura than the previous received from the wood from the chopped down tree. So it means that so simultaneously we found on a way to source Ukuba butter in a sustainable sourcing that allows us to enrich our products with hydrating and restorative properties. Riesling at the same time we also are contributed to the protections of the Ukuba tree from extinction. Wow, thank you, Kevin. I think you answered my next question there in the relation to circular economy. What could be more circular than helping us get more from what we already have? So great example. Um, thank you. And I would now like to go back to, to Jukka and ask you, we heard from Ashley earlier that uh, food production really has some significant impacts on biodiversity, um, driving a lot of biodiversity loss. and. Uh, for instance, in these recent results that Ashley shared, shifting to more um, plant-based proteins is one example of an, an important lever to, to halt uh, biodiversity loss. And I was wondering if you could tell us a bit more about uh, what it is that you, you do in, in relation to addressing uh, biodiversity loss. And because, uh, I mean, this is not only happening in, in Finland, but also it's a global, global phenomenon. Yeah, <clears throat> I think one of the uh, biggest things that we as a food company can uh, do in terms of addressing uh, the loss of biodiversity is actually to to make it to a business case. We, we need to understand that this is actually an essential and crucial part of, of making any business. <clears throat> and and uh, if, if you take biodiversity out of the business formula of, of any food company, there's absolutely nothing left. So, so there's a lot of that we need to do uh, to, to um, get the farmers to, to work with us to address the biodiversity on, on the fields, uh, both uh, you know, the biodiversity underground and above ground, and, uh, and talk it as, as, as a business case, not something on top of the current 
uh, what we do um, and and as a, uh, and and just cute pollinators fiddling with them, but just uh, talk about money. And, and if we if we are able to talk that the practices that we're able to, uh, to with what we are able to to promote the biodiversity uh, enhances the growing conditions, um, which makes more uh, yield and, and so on. It, I think that's one of the most important things that we can we can uh, do as a food company, inspire and, and encourage uh, to, to see this as, as a, a business case. Well, and you say, I, I have to follow up on this, uh, Joke, when you say inspiring and encouraging solutions. I think in part, uh, if that's been done in Finland, do you think this, this same practice can be scaled globally? Do, do we, are we looking at the same types of solutions in, in Finland or could this be used in, well, in, in globally? Yeah, I think Finland is a very special country, but not that special. Uh, of course, the, the, the practices are, are scalable. And, uh, uh, and can be taken to, to other countries. Um, and, and the practices are not, you know, that uh, super scientific uh, rocket science, uh, fairly simple things that we, we can do as, as, uh, on, on the fields with the farmers. Uh, so, so definitely these are truly scalable things. Well, thank you, Jukka, and thank you, Kevin. Thank you both, both of you, for sharing your uh, stories about your very interesting companies. Uh, I would like you to stay on, and I would also like to invite back or two uh, previous speakers, Ashley and Suki, to the screen. And as we do that, I would also encourage the speakers to keep asking questions, especially to our uh, last two uh, speakers that haven't had as much time here on the screen. But Going back to our two previous uh, speakers, I would like to start with uh, Ashley. We got a question here from, from the viewers in terms of um, the impact of regenerative agriculture um, and uh, the impact that this has on biodiversity. How can, we, how can that be measured? Because I know you have some recent findings that look a little bit at this. Could you please tell us a little bit more about this? Yeah, so just really quickly, the way we, we do this in a model is to essentially assume that um, the current sort of monocropping or multi-cropping techniques um, sort of have a certain baseline impact on bio biodiversity intactness, which we have a tremendous model um, and database that the Natural History Museum in London keeps hold of. And what we do is then compare that with biodiversity intactness on um, areas or types of farming that are much more um, much better for biodiversity. And so essentially it's just tweaking the amount of land that is under regenerative agriculture to that based on sort of what we know about how um, good these uh, regenerative systems are for biodiversity. Well, thank you, Ashley. And, and we'll stay on the topic of agriculture as we get a more specific question on, on bean. It's faba beans. How are they grown? I think maybe um yeah well not yeah just how, how are how are your beans grown uh it's, it's a very traditional crop uh that's been grown here in finland already longer than for example potatoes um and uh they they grow here in in finland uh actually we cr harvest our beans su super close to our factory so uh yeah, I think there is nothing too too special about the way they are grown or anything. It's just one of the crops uh, that are very um, good for, for example, uh, they um, they are very pollinator friendly, for example, and they fix. I I cannot remember the word in English. Yeah, just move on. <laughs> Thank you, Jukka. I think that shows that we don't need to rely fully on, on soft commodities from across the globe. There are probably a lot of solutions that yeah. are lurking around our, our own backyard. I think we have time for one more question for, and I would like to uh, go back to uh, Suki here. Um, when, when you think of, well, um, we can we can halt biodiversity loss, but we can also reverse biodiversity loss. Uh, so, so I guess the question is, how do we make sure improved biodiversity is not simply a side effect of circular economy, but a core principle? Well, that's a tricky question, but I think uh, just going back into the 
the three principles. I think just looking at it from a systems perspective rather than looking at things in isolation is quite important. That recycling in itself won't be enough or reusing on its, on its own is not enough. Regen on its own either. We have to understand we're part of a system. We're all interconnected and we need to work together to solve these challenges. So if we look at, let's say, fashion, it's how do you grow your fibers regeneratively? But how do you employ business models that increase the utilization? How do you design your clothes that, you know, so that they, are, they can uh, last the test of time? Um, and working together with retailers and with co customers to bring back the, that clothing and setting the collection services in place. So we need policymakers there to help us set that infrastructure. And then we need the recycling technology so we can make sure that it is recycled at high level and we can preserve that value. So we can't do this on our own. We really need to work all together to really, going back to before, that transformative change that we need to not only halt, but also reverse biodiversity loss. Oh, thank you, Suki. I think you, I like that word that you mentioned there, transformative change. This is not a piecemeal approach. This is about transformative change. Thank you all four of you for sharing your very interesting business solutions and recent findings with us. Uh, thanks a lot for joining us. And we would now like to, to move on um, to our next, next um, topic here. And I'm really delighted to invite my Citra colleague, Mika Koria, to join me here in the studio. And he will host a panel that will tell us a little bit more about um, well, what's actually needed to embed uh, circularity in a more nature-based economy, uh, including some concrete tools and enablers as well. So I'm really delighted to have you here uh, with me, Mika. And I think just, just what were your thoughts on, on all of this that we heard just now? I think it's really exciting things, and especially the reports on circular economy were very, really encouraging. It's a lot happening, and I guess we'll be hearing more just now. Thank you, Tim. I'm really keen to get the next discussion started. In this panel, we will be looking at the opportunities of biodiversity. We aim to cover the nexus of finance, measurements and consistent tools as they are crucial in realizing the potential that circular economy provides for biodiversity. Why exactly are we talking about finance, measurements and tools? The financial risks caused by climate change and biodiversity loss could be catastrophic. And as we heard in the earlier panel, the business opportunities of biodiversity are thus far poorly understood. To evaluate these risks and opportunities of biodiversity, um, the, the businesses and investors are quickly realizing that broad corporate responsibility pledges are no longer sufficient. Concrete and measurable targets are needed. Measurements and tools are key for understanding climate and biodiversity loss risks and opportunities that lie in natural capital. But also, we cannot solve climate change and biodiversity loss without the help of private capital, as public resources are simply not enough. To address these topics, I'm excited to introduce our distinguished panelists next. Dr. Christopher Kaminker is the head of sustainable investment research and strategy at Lumpach Odier Investment Managers. Jess McGlynn is the corporate engagement lead at Science Based Targets Network. And Marijn Dols is the global director of open innovation and circular economy for food at Danone. Thank you for joining us today. Let's start with you, Christopher, first. At Lombach Odier, you've seized the opportunity of investing in natural capital. And you have a fund which contains roughly 50 companies and many circular solutions. And it has grown from 400 million to nearly $1 billion in assets under management. Could you tell us a little bit more about this strategy and how do you select these companies? Sure, thank you very much. That was really fascinating so far. You've actually heard quite a lot of what I'm going to say already um, at a, a higher level. I'll just give you a few examples here. So why don't we step back and think about what does investing in natural capital mean for us? Why would a, an old Swiss bank Think that this is a, a good or important thing to do and for us it has to do with the economy a macro reason a change that's occurring in the economy and two micro reasons uh, effectively better productivity step function changes in productivity from the industrial circular economy and very importantly new 
avenues of growth, revenue growth from the circular bio economy. So effectively, we've found over 650 companies that are really making money hand over fist in either harnessing nature for new avenues for growth or preserving nature through more circular business models, um, through the sharing economy uh, or through moving towards the zero waste economy. Fundamentally, though, the reason that we are interested in biodiversity and natural capital is because our prevailing economic model or perhaps the legacy economic model is linear, right? We've discussed this. It's a take, make, waste economy. It's very extractive, a lot of waste that damages natural capital on the way in and on the way out. And the reality is it's unsustainable. It's, uh, you know, transgressing the planetary boundaries. It's creating climate change. It's uh, creating biodiversity loss. And these planetary boundaries are behind some of the world's most important industries, food, agriculture, real estate, tourism, uh, healthcare, materials. These are all sectors that rely on nature as the basis for the underpinning of what they're doing. That's why there's that statistic that half of the world economy relies on nature. So what we're interested in doing is understanding the change that's occurring at the level of the economy to become more circular and how companies can grow and improve their profitability by contributing through their business models to that change. Thank you so much, Christopher, those, for those remarks. Uh, Jess, I had a question for you. Uh, what are the science-based targets exactly, and what is new about the science-based targets for nature in relationship to the earlier science-based targets for climate? Yeah, thanks, Mika. So science-based targets for nature are an extension of the science-based targets for climate, and it's the same exact NGOs that supported science-based targets for climate that are working with us. We're creating methods right now to set integrated targets for all of nature, which we say is oceans, land, biodiversity, and fresh water. And the methods will allow a company or a city to um, set targets that provide co-benefits across nature, but also for climate. The targets are gonna allow the companies to know that they're taking enough of the right actions in the right places to stay within environmentally safe and socially just operating space. So we know companies are doing a lot on nature right now, which is wonderful, but we get asked the question, are we doing enough? We wanna do a little bit, we don't wanna just keep doing a little bit better than before. We have big crises that we're facing with, with biodiversity and climate. So what do we need to do? So our methods will help answer that. Our initial guidance is already out on the website if anyone's interested, and we'll be releasing our very first methods at the end of the year. They'll be freshwater methods, and we encourage everyone to take a look at those. All of our methods will be complete at the end of 2022, and at that time, a company or city will actually be able to set a target with us that we can validate and um, say, yep, this is good. <laughs> Thank you so much. And we look really forward to seeing those freshwater uh, methods that will be published in due course. Um, Marijn, um, the food sector is one of the biggest drivers for biodiversity loss. Um, how do you, as a major food producer, aim to create positive impact for biodiversity? And how do you see your role in this? And sort of what are the challenges and opportunities that lie ahead? Thanks, Mika. Uh, thanks for the question. Uh, yeah, the food and ag sector are indeed part of the issue. The race for infinite growth uh, in the finite world has uh, was powered through efficiency great, uh, gains and it drove us to a more specialized and centralized food system, which then in turn led to the very notion of food as a commodity uh, or the notion, uh, just think about it, of food as a cash crop. And in many ways, what we're facing is a design problem. We've created a system that simply does not fit um, the living system that we're a part of, the non-linear living system called nature. However, therefore, it's also a tremendous opportunity to become an essential part of the solution, because if it's a design issue, we can redesign our solutions and redesign the very goal of the system. Uh, if you look uh, at design as the expression of intent, we, can, we also have the power to create new products, new services, categories, and even business models through innovation that express a different intent, uh, the intent to create a regenerative food future uh, by design. Now, that being said, systems don't change overnight. As systems have inertia, they have antibodies uh, like system lock-ins. 
which we have to innovate and experiment our way out of. Uh, these lock-ins uh, are on every level and touch every element, ranging from the existing highly specialized and centralized infrastructure, think of farming equipment, think of where we have processing equipment, um, and all the way to the financial system in which we have, uh, as an example, excluded nature through negative externalities that are not reflected, and equally so by not capturing the value of positive externalities. Uh, but again, that is also the opportunity. Uh, and I'll, I'll point to something very recent, which is yesterday's announcement by the New York Stock Exchange and uh, Intrinsic Exchange Group on the creation of a new asset class, a natural asset company that is developed to do exactly this, to monetize ecosystem services like carbon, water, uh, biodiversity, um, that natural assets actually create every, every year. However, what we have to be careful of is that it's not a mere matter of practices and technologies, uh, because here's a menu approach won't work. What we need is we need to shift our understanding, we need to shift our uh, intention. Uh, but as a company, as an industry, we have a responsibility, but we also have a massive opportunity in this shift. Um, let's take a little bit of a step deeper. Uh, Christopher, um, could you give us some more examples on what are the sort of companies in the fund that have a positive impact on biodiversity that use circular economies uh, principles to rebuild natural capital? Sure. So. I think an important point was just made, which is that effectively today's externalities are tomorrow's risks. Uh, we think a lot of this is not priced in yet. Most of it is not priced into markets, but it will become priced in, in our view. This is a genuine investment conviction for us that policy, regulation, market forces, just the circular option becoming the cheaper one, consumer preferences, and investor capital reallocation are going to shift us to a much uh, leaner, more circular and, and cleaner uh, economy. And so for us, when we're looking for companies, what we're looking for are companies that have their business models that are behind this shift. Finding companies that have business models that are inherently protective of biodiversity or work to restore uh, biodiversity is possible. But what we found is that there is a larger universe of companies who are removing the pressure from this linear take make waste economy on biodiversity and on natural capital. So in the water space, I mean, our water system globally is uh, terribly inefficient, um, very wasteful and uh, results in toxicity flooding into the natural environment, right? Company, for instance, in our investment universe called Advanced Drainage Systems is fixing that problem through much better water management systems and pipes that are used from recycled uh, material that protect biodiversity from having toxic um, water waste uh, flow flow into um, you know uh, oceans and rivers and so on and damage biodiversity. So this is effectively a way to make our economy more resilient and protect natural capital. Uh, we see this in the geospatial space as well. I mean, Trimble is an example of a company there in, in the investment universe again that is using geospatial capabilities to monitor biodiversity to monitor impacts of the economy on biodiversity. And that allows us to respond as investors and as companies to improve and to minimize the impact on biodiversity. And then finally, you see a whole generation of companies that are using nature, are harnessing nature, um, are figuring out that nature has had this two billion year head start on us to, to, under, to create the most efficient and effective way to do things. And now we have technology, synthetic biology and, and uh, CRISPR and, and all sorts of other technological capabilities to figure out how to unlock those secrets. And, and we see so much activity in that space. And it, it is in the biodiversity space all the way down to the microbial levels. Uh, companies like Christian Hansen that are manipulating enzymes to preserve the, the shelf life of food, which minimizes food waste and so on and so forth. Thank you, Christopher, and we'll get back to resilience in a bit. Um, but just to touch on the on the technical questions um, and technical criteria, Jess, I had a question. How do you ensure uh, scientific robustness with the with the targets that that you are working with? 
Yeah, that's a good question. So we're doing it in three ways. First of all, the, the folks that are creating the methods right now are made up of the 70 partner NGOs that are part of the science-based target network. And they have a lot of technical expertise on biodiversity and nature and, and the science around that. So that's the first way. The second way is that we're partnered with the Earth Commission, which is a group of scientists led by Johan Rockström and Joita Gupta. And they're putting some of the science into the science-based target. So for example, we need to understand ecological thresholds within biomes and ecoregions in order to set targets. They're creating that right now. And so that will help us with the robustness of the methods. And then finally, we've got a very robust um, public consultation process that we'll be using. So we're not gonna go straight to methods release. We're gonna do several beta versions, send it out to experts and then send it out publicly. So everything's transparent and we get feedback from a wide variety of people to make sure that everything we're doing is robust and scientifically makes sense. Thank you. Thanks for that answer. And, and, and Marijn, if you, if you were to comment and, and sort of build on that, um, the known has piloted the science-based targets for nature goals, and you're also a front runner with supporting circular economy for packaging. Um, what role does circular economy play in achieving your biodiversity goals? Yeah, I mean, we've been working closely with many partners because none of us can tackle the, the challenge or, or if you will, the opportunity alone. So we've worked with WWF, uh, we've worked uh, with, and we were, we were at the inception of the One Planet Businesses for Biodiversity, OP2B, uh, which is a coalition of businesses uh, that believe that we can use the power of business to restore biodiversity. And um, from the very early days, we've been working with the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, where we've been driving both the new plastics economy but also actually the circular economy for food. Um, from the very first report onwards to the report that is gonna come out in a few days that actually talks about uh, designing for a circular economy um, to the point I made just now. Um, as I mentioned uh, to your previous question, we requ require a shift in understanding and intention. Uh, now, I would define the circular economy as a, as a CE scholar, as an alternative economic model. Um, it's, it's a restorative economy by design and it's analogous to nonlinear systems. Um, and it's, it's anchored in an ecocentric worldview instead of an anthropocentric, which actually drove us to the linear economy. And it, it, it aims for stability rather than that infinite growth that we mentioned. And it achieves that by effectiveness. Now, as the, the circular economy aims to optimize the system as a whole, um, it actually harnesses diversity because it's diversity which makes it resilient and work at every scale. And that's where biodiversity comes in. Biodiversity basically is a system health indicator. In other words, if we aim for a circular economy as a restorative economy, then biodiversity becomes one of the key indicators and metrics of system performance, just like we need to aim for health uh, indicators like personal health. Uh, they can be community health, they can be societal health. Each of them have to be tracked. Um, but as we need an experimental mindset in the way we develop the solutions, we also need an experimental mindset in the way de we develop actually the metrics. Um, we need to develop these two in parallel and simply accept that we have to uh, innovate and experiment our way into this new system, uh, which is why we strongly believe that we need to partner and continuously advance the, the, the holistic nature of all of these indicators. Great. Thank you. Thank you for those points. And, and sort of when we start looking at the future, how it unfolds, Christopher, I was hoping to ask you, um, today, for example, resource consumption is highly subsidized in many, many parts of the world. Um, but in the future, we might ta tax the drivers for biodiversity loss, uh, such as land use, pollution, and um, well, greenhouse gas emissions are being, being taxed to an extent uh, in some parts of the world. But sort of what are your thoughts on what is the impact of taxing these drivers for companies in the future? It's, in, it's really important to understand for investors what type of natural capital risk they're carrying in their portfolios. 
and think about pension funds, think about insurance companies. These are the, the types of financial asset owners that are owning stocks and bonds, which may be carrying massive amounts of stranded asset risk uh, related to natural capital. So you need to be able to spot that, find out where it is, who's carrying that, and then do something about it, de-risk it, hedge it, um, divest from it, um, engage with the company and make them aware of it. Uh, use the power of stewardship and voting as, a, as an active voter, uh, as an active owner to, or a bondholder to get the company to do something about these unpriced externalities. I mean, you know, just go back to some of the points that have come up earlier today. Natural capital has effectively infinite value, but it doesn't necessarily have a price on it today, whether it's water or the pollination services uh, that are that uh, bees are responsible. I mean, we've heard this before, bees don't send invoices, right? They provide $600 billion worth of value to the global economy per year through pollination, um, but they don't charge for that. They really should. Um, but, uh, you know, that if we lose pollinators and 70% of insects have been lost in Europe uh, over the last 30 years, that could undermine the food system, uh, that could, if we lose biodiversity, that could undermine the source of drug discovery in the pharmaceutical industry. Biodiversity, it really, we see it as protecting the economy as, you know, diversification uh, protects the portfolio. So you need to find that. That's why we think that science-based targets initiatives for nature are really important. We think geospatial uh, analysis is, is potentially transformative here to look down from space to see who is damaging natural capital um, and then to uh, do something about it. And the TNFD, uh, we need disclosures and we need a, a, a harmonized disclosures so that investors can price that risk. Thank you, Christopher, for those remarks. And, and to the listeners to whom the TNFD framework might be new, it stands for Task Force for Nature-Related Financial Disclosures effectively trying to think about nature-related financial risks the same way as for climate risks there already exists some methodology. Thank you, Christopher. And, and Jess, you know, I mean, just to kind of do a bit more interlink on the, on the, with you as different speakers, uh, finance is, is a key enabling condition in the transition, but how do, you, how do you see the role that finance can play for science-based targets specifically? Yeah, so we see the role in two different ways. One is we see the finance sector having to invest in the big transformations we're going to need to have a nature positive future. That is fundamental. And I guess part of that is also divesting <laughs> from things that do dis destroy our, our chance of a, a nature positive future. And then the second, the second area, which I think is more um, near term important, is to send a signal that's very strong to companies all over the world that they're going to be required to take action on their material impacts on nature. So right now there's a very weak signal and there's a few niche um, finance institutions that are that care and are making a lot of um, promotion about this, which is awesome, but we need a lot more. And um, I talk to companies every day all over the world and some of them are second movers. I don't call them laggards. I call them second movers and they're like, we can't make a business case to our leadership, even though we want to, until the investor says it's going to be important. So we really need to see um, a cohesive, harmonized signal from the FIs. And, and to that end, we are working with several FIs now to make sure that what we're producing in terms of metrics and asks companies is very much aligned with what they're asking for too. So TNFD is one of the prime examples. We are observers on, on their task force. They're part of our working group for finance. And so um, really what it comes down to is we have to send a very harmonized signal with a lot of FIs to um, get companies to have the, the business case they actually need to take the big actions they're going to have to take. Thanks for those remarks, and I'm sure they were well listened to. And Marain, if I may ask you on that note, how do you see the role of investors with facilitating your work to pursue circular economy principles? What do you, what do you think based on also what the uh, what panelists said earlier. Yeah, I think um, the role of investors uh, ultimately is going to be key um, to the point that was made just before. We need to finance the transition. Um, we cannot finance that transition on our own. We will need the financial community to work with us. Uh, we have been piloting, uh, for instance, in 2018, 
uh, we launched 300 million of, of social bonds in, in um, the same year we launched uh, 2 million of ESG type loans. And uh, last year we, or no, actually it was 2019, uh, we launched for the first time a carbon adjusted uh, EPS. Um, and then on the other end side, what we saw recently, which I think is a very positive sign, is that when we um, asked for a vote uh, to change our status into a, what we call in French, entreprise à mission. Uh, for Americans, it's not completely the same, but similar to a public benefit company. So basically anchoring our um, social and ecological mission into our foundational documents. It was improved by 99.9, sorry, 99% of investors. And so I think um, there are a lot of positive signs. And even though we talked to the fact that um, the externalities haven't been priced in yet um, and that the positive externalities haven't been monetized yet. Um, the other sign that I'm seeing is, for instance, the, the launch that and the announcement that I mentioned yesterday. It talks about the actual uh, value of um, natural assets that's being created every year is being estimated at 125 trillion. So just imagine the potential and the upside uh, that we have there in uh, also in um, and on the other hand side, the negative uh, value that we have. So I'm personally, I'm convinced that it's a mere matter of time uh, for the financial community uh, to come along. Um, we're doing everything we can to speed that up. Thank you so much. And, and we have time for brief remarks still on a question that came from the audience on pricing these externalities. And this is uh, to Christopher and Jess. Uh, how can we apply economic levers to incentivize protecting nature? Do we need to put a price on the critical natural ecosystems on the planet? If I could have quick, re quick thoughts on, on that question. I'll start. I mean, I'm, I'm not a finance expert, but I, th I think we do, but we can't wait for that to happen. I mean, we've been talking about that for a really long time. We've been around for years and we've been talking about um, putting the right price on water, for example, and it's it's not happening yet. So um, I think part of the business case is doing that and working on that and also removing subsidies um, that are negative. That's a huge thing. <laughs> That's a real, real detriment to nature. And sometimes we forget about that. So it's the pricing, but also removing the subsidies that are encouraging bad behavior. But again, I'll just go back to my original thing. It's also sending a signal, a true signal, a strong signal that's harmonized uh, across all investors that this is important for the companies in their portfolio to pay attention and take real action. That will also help in the, in the near term while we're working on this pricing issue. And Christopher, what are your quick thoughts? You know, we have time for quick remarks. Yeah, I would underscore many of those points. I mean, there's a long list of uh, policy interventions that uh, are textbook, you know, whether it's payment payments for ecosystem services or debt for nature swaps or even biodiversity offsets, prices on water, prices on pollution, taxes on plastic, uh, and so on and so forth. There's a very long list of these things. Um, the OECD publishes on them regularly and uh, countries are putting them into place. I mean, we've seen a, a huge and exponential increase in um, regulations related to natural capital that will uh, continue to increase exponentially. And, uh, you know, uh, most uh, folks are not all that good with exponentials. Uh, they're hard to understand. We, we live in a linear economy. Um, we sell division is exponential, but you need a microscope to see that. Um, so, you know, uh, exponential change can really overtake um, uh, people's, uh, you know, vested interests and their um, current uh, understanding uh, of a matter and, and also markets. So we think that, you know, uh, quite a lot of this is going to get priced in and probably sooner, faster, uh, more aggressively than people expect. But put all that to the side, uh, innovation is super important here. And you know, we our strategy invests in small to mid cap companies. Th these are companies that are just looking to disrupt these hugely inefficient um, economic sectors. And they're gonna do it through technology and through research and development and demonstration. 
and better value and uh, you know step function changes in productivity from additive manufacturing and synthetic biology. So that that's that's what we are you know focusing on those innovative companies that are going to use the latest access to technology to ride the wave of innovation and, and regulation. For those powerful last last words, and thank you to our distinguished panelists for those these remarks. Um, they were really really thought provoking. Um, by maintaining the value of materials through circular economy principles, we can also realize the business opportunities of consuming natural resources more sustainably, which also reduces pressure on biodiversity and climate. We need to better understand what the what types of robust targets companies should set them for themselves. But also, we have a couple of frameworks that are helpful. For example, the TNFD that was mentioned earlier today, as well as the science-based targets for nature. But it's important to remember that we cannot solve climate change or biodiversity loss without the help of private capital, as public resources are simply not enough. The investor action in this theme is of paramount importance. Thank you to the audience. Thank you to the panelists. And I will now hand over to my colleague, Tim. Wow, thank you, Mika, and thank you to the panelists. What a, um, what a journey through systems thinking, unlocking the secrets of nature, and finding concrete ways of measuring and uh, disclosing on, on these things to, to really, well, to get what we kind of finished on, to get towards this uh, exponential change. So I don't know what's left to say, but I think we can think of something here, actually. And I'm really delighted to invite my Citra colleague, and Youth Delegate for Climate and Biodiversity at the Finnish Youth Council, Emma Sairanen. It's really good to have you here in the studio. And what, what are your thoughts after listening to this, this session? Yeah, thanks, Tim, for inviting me. And I took many interesting notes, but maybe to highlight three messages that stood out to me. I really found it interesting how Marang pointed out that the current failure is a design problem, so we can design ourselves out. And when we think about like art and innovation, we often say that boundaries build creativity. So I'm really looking forward how this finite system of our planet can work as a, a source of creativity for us. And when we create these innovations, I really find it so important what nature-based solutions are doing. So they are giving us concrete or businesses concrete ways to see what is actually enough, which is extremely important. And maybe a final message from Kevin. I really appreciate the work they are doing with the local communities. And this is also an important youth message that we should combine the old and ancient knowledge with the new knowledge to create something beautiful. So really appreciate your work, Kevin. Well, thanks, Emma. And I, I think this um, that already captures a lot of how I felt as well. And I, I wanted to ask and pick up on something that Suki said, that we need to move uh, towards transformative change. Like all these different actions are uh, very important, but we need we need to change, change the system. Um, and what are some of the, from your perspective as a youth delegate, that you would like to highlight if you were to make this uh, transformative change happen? Yeah, thanks for the question. For me, I would say that at the really core of transformative change, we should change our beliefs, our norms and our values, because these beliefs, norms and values, they manifest in our everyday life through everyday actions. They define how we interact with other people. And of course, we also bring them every day with us to our workplaces and businesses and finance sector, for example. Um, so really starting there and maybe some concrete thoughts from the youth perspective of what needs to change on the thought level. Uh, we, youth, we are calling for less individualism, less ego, less competition, and we are calling for more compassion, solidarity and love. And especially extending the solidarity we feel beyond our immediate family and friends to people on the other side of the planet and to the rest of the living world, like indigenous peoples have really well set out during this forum. 
Well, thanks, Emma. I think that resonates with me and the circular economy thinking as well, which is not a competition, but more a team team sport. But I, I wanted to ask you one last question because I know you're the, well, you participated in the UN biodiversity negotiations representing youth. And yesterday we heard some, some very interesting remarks from um, uh, Elizabeth Mrema from the uh, Convention on Biological Diversity. Uh, and she mentioned, for instance, the role of circular economy and that we need to embed the impacts and dependencies on nature across our economy in finance, businesses and in policy. Uh, are there any, is there anything there that you would like to add to, to what you said? <laughs> yeah, uh, that is so important. And actually, in the new targets, there will be a specific target for businesses, which is extremely important. Uh, but maybe what my final message here would be that global leaders have already twice set global targets for nature and both times global leaders have failed. And now we're in the process of setting new global targets to actually reverse biodiversity loss by 2030. And this time meeting these targets is a must. Failing is no longer an option and to get to the point where we actually meet these targets. Government action, I don't believe government action is enough. We need everyone on board with this joint agenda of protecting and regenerating our life support system. So I would like to call on everyone listening in today that next April, when these global targets for nature are adopted at COP15, be there listening to the process and make these global targets into actions of your own, because together we can and together we must meet the global targets for nature. Thank you so much, Emma, and I hope the, the viewers take this message to, to heart. Uh, it's paramount that we do this, and I think as our director said yesterday, this is an all hands on deck situation and we have to do that. Thank you so much for joining us. And I think everyone, ha everything has probably been said at this point, but I will try and wrap up really quickly and say that, well, I think you, hopefully you will feel at this point that um, if you didn't feel it before, that turning the tide on biodiversity lost is paramount, like we just heard. And as Akanksha started with, um, we need to move from a, an extractive economy towards a regenerative one, and we need transformative change. In doing that, there are large business opportunities, which I hope today's session have, has, has illustrated. And often that is about unlocking the secrets of nature. And here, the circular economy, which is built on learnings from nature, can be a very powerful tool. I would just like to round up by saying that um, this is not the, the end, but there are many other World Circular Economy Forum accelerator sessions already today. For instance, you have uh, three sessions that are financing the circular economy transition, circularity across the mining and metals value chain, as well as circular North America. On top of that, you have plenty of uh, WCEF side events happening throughout the rest of the year. So do check out the programs that we are linking to in the chat here and that you can also find on Citrus uh, website. So thank you everyone for listening. Uh, suur kiitos kaikille. Uh, tak, thank you and bonne nuit.